Hi everyone, I'm Barrett Guillen. And I'm Ashley Brown Ruiz, and this is Unlocking Us. We're back! Hey guys, it's Barrett. If you remember, I am the Chief of Staff for Brene Brown Education and Research Group. And I'm Ashley, a licensed clinical social worker and the senior director for The Daring Way. And we're also Brene's younger twin sisters. And we are here to talk to Brene about her new book, Atlas of the Heart, Mapping Meaningful Connection and the Language of Human Experience, which came out yesterday, November 30th. <laughs> Guys, we actually got to turn the table on Brene today and we asked her the questions. This is a three-part series that we're doing. It's a sister's book club on Atlas. And the first two episodes, Ashley and I interview Brene about her book. In the last episode, we're going to ask you guys to submit any questions you have after diving into the book. We'll give more details on how to submit your questions, but get the book and start reading so you can hang along with us. It's really going to be fun. A little bit more about Brene before we get going, just in case we've never actually read her full bio on the Locking Us podcast, so here we go. <laughs> Dr. Brene Brown is a research professor at the University of Houston, where she holds the Huffington Foundation Endowed Chair at the Graduate College of Social Work. Brene is also a visiting professor in management at the University of Texas at Austin McComb School of Business. She has spent the past two decades studying courage, vulnerability, shame, and empathy. She is the author of five number one New York Times bestsellers and is the host of the weekly Spotify original podcast, Unlocking Us. Here we are. <laughs> and Dare to Lead. Brene's books have been translated into more than 30 languages, and her titles include Dare to Lead, Braving the Wilderness, Rising Strong, Daring Greatly, and The Gifts of Imperfection. Most recently, Brene collaborated with Tarana Burke to co-edit You Are Your Best Thing, Vulnerability, Shame, Resilience, and the Black Experience. Her TED Talk, The Power of Vulnerability, is one of the top five most viewed TED Talks in the world. With over 50 million views. She's also the first researcher to have a filmed lecture on Netflix. The Call to Courage special debuted on the streaming service in April 2019. Brene lives here in Houston, right by her sisters, and with her husband, Steve. They have two kids, Ellen and Charlie. Here we go. So, Brene Brown, welcome to Unlocking Us. <laughs> <laughs> It's so great to be here. We're so excited to interview you. Oh my gosh, wait till we get to the rapid fire. We've added a few questions. Yeah. <laughs> so I can't okay, wait. that's not even funny. That's like a... <laughs> Ashley just winked at me. Seriously. Though it's going to be so much fun. My but kids could listen to this. I know. Okay. Oh, yeah. We got you. Okay. Yeah, of course. Okay. We have our kids could. We're good. Um, but we're excited to be here today to talk about Atlas of the Heart. <gasps> yes. yes. The new book. Beautiful. And you so graciously let us interview you to talk to you about this book. So, can we jump in? Let's do it. <laughs> I'm scared. Okay, so you start unlocking us with every guest with one question. Mm -hmm. Tell us your story. Now, we're going to pause a little bit <laughs> because we know your story <laughs> and everybody knows your story. Yeah. But, but what we want to ask you is, tell us about little Brene, who already started studying emotions and understanding <laughs> emotions from a young age, and why you did that. It's so funny, because I'm not nervous, because I'm still like, I'm the boss of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm yeah, glad you're you not. Are it. <laughs> I'm like, at first I was like, oh my God, I'm anxious, I'm anxious, what are they going to say? And then I'm like, I'll just be like, no. I'm not, we're not doing, and then, yeah. <laughs> then, <laughs> isn't that awful? Okay, that's awful, but I think like that, but this is, I'm, I'm armoring up. Okay, um, little Brene, you know, I think the first time that I realized that, wow, I have some kind of really massive talent or superpower, I think we still lived in New Orleans, and so maybe y'all were newborns, I was probably eight, I had negotiated with mom and dad that y'all were staying after they brought you home. You're so weird. Aren't you lucky that we stayed? I am actually really, really lucky. <laughs> but I tell you, as eight year old, I was like, wow, whatever this thing is, is loud. Um, and there's 
And beautiful. And beautiful. <laughs> and there are two of them. And how long are they staying? Um, <laughs> I think it was just an ability to, well, I knew it was about patterns because mom, do you know mom used to sew a lot? Did y'all know that? Yeah, because I remember like the patterns that we would get from the store or whatever. Oh, shopping like, for calls or something. Yeah, the pattern yeah. store. Yeah, the fabric store. So mom used to make dresses where my dress matched her dress, matched my doll's dress. Oh, yeah, and sometimes, yeah, and sometimes she, in fact, there's an old picture somewhere of us getting on a train and she's got on like a yellow plaid shift dress and I have on the same shift dress and then my doll has on the same shift dress. And sometimes she would take me to the fabric store and I'd be able to pick out the fabric and she made all the clothes for my dolls. And so she would often say, well, I don't know about this pattern. It's really hard to match, like on the back, you know, how yeah. clothes that have the pattern that matches were like around the zipper and stuff. And so I knew what a pattern was. And then we had that gold couch, the infamous gold couch. <laughs> and I realized, man, that's a pattern. And then what I realized very quickly from like situations at Holy Name of Jesus, where I went to elementary school, um, <laughs> it's a heavy elementary school name. I was just going to say. I'm so glad we were Tice Tigers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, holy name of you. <laughs> yeah, holy name of Jesus. So I would recognize that there. I would recognize it at home with mom and dad. I would definitely recognize it like when Aunt Trina and Uncle Joe would come, or like Mima and Curly would come. I could tell people are starting to act this way. Something bad's going to happen in a little bit, or people are saying this, and I think it's meant to be funny. And some people are laughing, and some aren't. And it's going to go bad in a little bit. And so I think from very early on, I understood that there was like this holy trinity of emotion, thinking, and behavior, that they were inextricably connected. And if you could put two of them together, you could predict the third. So if you could see kind of how people were feeling and behaving, you could predict what they were thinking. If you knew what they were thinking and how they were feeling, you knew how they were going to behave, which was the biggest one for me. And yeah. Little Brene was, I mean, really, I tell a couple of stories in the book about that, like Memorial Northwest Marlins. Mm -hmm. Like we had a swim coach that was out mm -hmm. of control sometimes. And everybody tried to figure out like, God, when he loses his shit, what's happening? Mm, yeah. And it only took me like two or three practices before I realized, because at first, you know, when you're not a fast swimmer and you're not the fastest or the best, you think, oh God, he's after the kids that are the, not the great swimmers. But I was like, God, he's not after those kids. But sometimes he's after the great swimmers and sometimes he's after the shitty swimmers or the, you know, the swimmers who are trying. We'll rephrase that since I was one of them. But then I realized very quickly, oh, he's after the kids that are not obviously demonstrating effort. And he doesn't like it during free swim when you swim like 100 yards, whatever you wanted. We were in a meter pool, actually. So 100 meters, whatever you wanted. He really had a preference for the backstrokers. So I always got in the lane with the grittiest kids, even not the best kids, but the grittiest kids. And then I always swam backstroke. Never was I in his crosshairs. Yeah. But I was really good at it. I did it all the time. Well, how did you navigate that? I mean, being so young, obviously you probably didn't have the language you have now to understand what the superpower was, but how did you navigate that? Well, I mean, I, I tell the story in the book. I thought something, is it fair to say that we had a kind of a shame-based family? Totally. Yep. Yeah. And I think, is it also fair to say that most of the shame came from a complete lack of normalizing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that mom and dad were in a lot of shame. Yes. Like, they were living in this cookie cutter suburb where the dads were supposed to be like this and the moms were supposed to be like this. And I'm being completely gender binary because that was also part of the expectation. Mm -hmm. And they both came from such hard places that I think they had like a always pretending, waiting to get caught feeling. And so they were always, I think, in a lot of shame. And so I think I was a very shame-based kid. So when I knew I could do that, I actually thought something was wrong with me. I thought, maybe I'm like a wizard. And the only reference I had at the time was like Sybil oh. and Carrie. Oh. You know, like unwell teenage girls are like witches, are crazy. Or so could you imagine?
imagine. Like, mom and dad, I know that I've disappointed you in a number of ways. You know, I'm not on the drill team. I'm not a cheerleader. I'm not dating a quarterback or a running back or anyone important on the offensive line. And I just really want to be in French club. And I like to wear a beret and smoke a little pot. And uh, <laughs> I also have superpowers. Like, <laughs> that, would not, that it would not have gone over well. So I just... I just use them, but I hid them. Yeah. How do you think that that skill set led to where you are right now in your life? I think it's a mixed bag. I think that there's a couple of things. One, my therapist today calls it hypervigilance. <laughs> That's your, that's your people, Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> your people, the therapy. The therapy. Um, the therapy. Um, call it hypervigilance and talk about it being exhausting yeah. and talk about it like always being on guard. Like one of the things I talk about, and this is like a really hard thing for me, is kind of, and I've talked about this before, like never feeling like I belonged in our family. Mm-hmm. And I think it was because of that hypervigilance. Like I never really could participate in the family because I always had to be watching and I always had to be careful, you know? And so even when things got really fun and everyone was laughing, I was like either the actual protector because shit was going bad or I was a protector in waiting. Yeah, because it was going to blow up. Because it was going to blow up. And it always did, right? Yeah. 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 And so I think on the bad side, it's an exhausting trait probably related to trauma and growing up in an unpredictable environment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the thing is that when people... Like, sometimes I feel shame even talking about, like, how we grew up, because I'm like, yeah, it was really fun, and it was really... Do you ever feel like that? Oh, yeah. Well, we were just driving through the old neighborhood the other day with two of my elementary school friends, and when we were talking about all of our friends, and you talk about this, too, back in the day, we had no idea what was going on in their house, but now we know what was going on in their house back then, and the power that we could have had if we would have been talking about it with each other is crazy. It's just so crazy, because you thought... I'm the only one laying in bed at night listening to the screaming come through the walls. Yeah. But I think the thing about the unpredictability is there was a lot of love in our house. And there was a lot of laughter in our house and a lot of fun. It was just unsafe, not because it was dangerous all the time, but because it was unpredictable all the time. Does that ring true for y'all? Totally fair. Yeah. It's weird if you're listening because we have to ask each other these questions because we almost come. Yeah. From different families. I mean, we don't. We have. same parents and we grew up all together but I'm eight years older and so so in one way the hypervigilance it's hard to carry I still can feel like that I can still feel like where is everybody who's safe you know those kind of things and so I think that was hard and then I think the superpower was understanding that's all the connections between thinking cognition feeling and behavior the other thing that I think was important is that when I started numbing with alcohol and probably smoking too much pot. I don't know how much is too much, but yeah, both. (laughs) What I realized is I lost those superpowers, that those superpowers were completely connected to not numbing. Damn. You know, and so I hate that the hypervigilance, I hate that part, and I think I have to work all the time to overcome that. But I'm grateful that I learned that In the AA Big Book, they say the promise of neutrality, where you're not running towards something or away from something, is only granted that that promise if you're in fit spiritual condition. And so I think leading me to recovery was a gift of that. 
leading me to this career was a gift.
không em chuyện tình yêu đâu biết được ngày mai rồi hôm nay em bên ai nhìn em khóc trên vai thôi hãy quên đi về với em hiện tại anh còn nhớ về ngày ta còn đắm say anh vẫn nhớ về người bên anh khi ấy em đã quên rồi câu hứa yêu trọn đời em bỏ anh rồi em vui tình nhân mãi cuộc tình này đã khác rồi mình kết thúc em ơi chuyện tình này đã chết rồi còn thích chi em ơi một lần em gian dối rồi còn cố yêu không vui một lần em đã phản bội làm vết thương chưa thì anh vẫn sẽ nếm cười người khác làm em vui còn anh xin kết thúc và giữ chút đau thương thôi ở nơi xa luôn nhớ về một mối duyên tình phai đường em đi nay khác rồi còn mỗi Còn mỗi xin anh thôi